It's amazing how much can happen in the twinkling of an eye. Dean and I both had dreams last night that were just enormous in scope. His on a his on a satanic level and mine on a on a I don't even know what you'd call it. But just when my dream was starting to get into the the thick of it, I heard Dean's car in my subconscious pull up in the driveway at five o'clock this morning or whatever time he got in, it woke me up. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God he got here. But uh, I wanted to go on from yesterday. Um, Anthea and Jemmy, you weren't in our thing yesterday, so you can watch the, the video. And, uh, oh, I want to um, Heidi, her, her um, experience of the Mother Mary thing. I was actually there for that. Were you? Yeah. Good. Yeah, we talked afterwards. I didn't want to, in the meeting, I didn't want to intrude on what was happening, like insert in there. Oh, that's cool. But I was, I was there. And when um, the woman started to tell that story, because I saw Heidi. And when the woman started to tell that story, I like looked for Heidi because I, I recognized that that's what you were talking about. Even though she was talking about Mary Magdalene, it was like, I still oh. was like, oh, there it is. And then she... Um, Heidi didn't tell this part of the story. At least this is how I saw it. So from my perspective, that lady told that story. And then I looked for Heidi. And then right after that, the facilitator told a long story about Mary Mag. She said, oh, yeah, and then Mary Magdalene. So in my mind, I went, there it is, there it is. So I started to send her a message. Um, I did send her a message, just like hearts and like, not saying there it is, but my mind is like, what's happening? And she never got the message. She didn't even know I was in the room. But when she was telling it last night about she had a doubt, she didn't tell the part about like right after her doubt, like someone else came in with like more. And then right after that, like I came in with like a message. So it was like, spirit was like, yes, it is. Yes, confirmation, yes, confirmation. <laughs> At least from my perspective, that's what it felt like. Like, yes, yes, yes. So as she was telling the story, I was like, oh, you didn't get my message. Oh, you didn't hear the other part. Anyway, we, we chatted a little bit afterwards. Yeah. Well, yesterday when she was sort of confirming and had that witness to that Mary story, I was shown that she was going to have another experience, uh, probably this week, like quite similar, like a follow-up experience. And I thought in my own mind, I just assumed it would be another Mary experience. But last night when we were driving home, Dean and I and Vinka went out to get fish and chips which is a little bit of a, a random and divine, like everything gets orchestrated, you know? So, and then driving home from that unprecedented moment of fish and chips, which was, it was out of the box. Vinka even said it was out of the box. We had this whole thing. And then when we, yeah. And then when we got up from our fish and chips, we were all sort of like in this moment of like, that was an unusual out of the box sort of fish and chips moment. And there was a box right beside us that had writing on it that said made with love we ne we didn't see it because it was dark when we sat down <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. so like, nothing i see means anything but it was just like a kind of a funny thing you know we sort of sat there and we all laughed at this thing it's like we sat right, right down next to this rubbish box that someone's chucked out of their car or something this box of rubbish couldn't see it because it was dark and we were talking about how out of the box this whole fish and chip moment was and then there was this box that said made with love in big letters on it. And uh, then when I was driving home, I was just thinking about all the, the spontaneous things that seemed to be coincidence and whatever. And I got this whole another download for um, Heidi that it's probably not going to be a Mother Mary experience that she's going to have, but it'll come through in the same frequency. And the idea of her fingertips yesterday that came to me, when you put your hands in the air, put your hands up. All you guys put your hands up. Now, try to feel your finger right up, Anthea. Put your arms right up in the air. Okay. Try to feel your fingertips in your mind. What do they feel like? There's a very light sensation, a very light awareness of them. Right. 
It's a very subtle kind of feeling. The blood sort of drained out of your hands a bit and there's this kind of like, there's almost an awareness, but it's almost like you can't feel the very tips of your fingertips, right? That's the sense in my mind, that sort of feeling of things, that very subtle feeling, you put your arms down, is what I get in my mind when I feel the spirit moving in me, right? It's this kind of subtle little flow of that very, very perceptible energy. And if I focus on it, it goes whoosh and comes right to the front of my consciousness and explodes into light, right? So that idea that I gave to Heidi, and I want you guys that didn't weren't yesterday there to go and watch yesterday's one once it's up. It's like that was only really part of the thing, part of the message. It's like the rest of the message is that the, that Mother Mary thing, the energy of the Mother Mary is an opening to um, a specific sort of aspect of salvation that Heidi in particular, in this case, is directly looking at, right? Whether she's aware of it or not. One of the things that happened for me early on in my um transformation i had all this energy going on i didn't know at that time what the hell energy really was what what is this vibration what am i feeling i just knew i was going through stuff and people kept coming up to me saying that i had the energy of moses right i had this real moses energy about me and uh even Claire Bear started to call me Moses for a minute there, and I asked her not to call me Moses. But that energy, feeling that energy, getting in touch with those subtle frequencies. We're used to all these ones, these heavy, dross, dull sort of human, you know, I feel good, I feel bad, all those sort of energies. But the other energies that are operating in the background, the ones that feel so lightly, like the ends of your fingertips, they're the ones when we listen, right? When we listen, we're actually feeling out. We're listening with feeling. We're listening. We're reaching out with our feelings for those very subtle little tiny frequencies that we can barely feel. All right. The voice for God is a still small voice. It's very quiet. It is easy to hear once you, once you tune in, but it's a still small voice. And when you're starting to learn to hear, sometimes it sounds like the static on a radio being tuned in the, you know, the old radio where you'd have to tune the dial and find the channel. Sometimes you hear this kind of, it's like you start to break through the thick of the consciousness and you feel this kind of like, <laughs> like a little noise there. That's almost like you're tuning into a specific frequency and then you feel it. Right. But of course the mind's always examining everything and it examines it. And as soon as you examine it, it's gone. So the, in the mind training, we're learning not to examine and put things into boxes and say, this is this and that is that. We're learning instead just to simply find that um, place inside us and sit there listening, right? So in the course, Jesus says in the last sessions, we simply say, God is, and we cease to speak and we wait, right? And we wait with a listening posture to hear the voice for God. That listening posture reaches out to those very, very subtle sort of beyond what we can almost comprehend, right? So it's like when you put your hands in the air, you can just barely feel that fingertips. That's what it's like. I can just barely hear something, but it's like in the distance. And there's a beautiful part in the course I posted up yesterday. Annie posted it actually, and I had to copy and paste it. There was no share button, but about the forgotten song. And it said, it says, listen, and you may catch a hint of an ancient melody, not quite forgotten, blah, 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 right? And it goes on. It's like, it's just that very little hint. It's so subtle. But when the mind is very quiet and you reach out with your feelings, you can feel it like the ends of your fingertips. Just, and that's almost exactly how it feels in your mind. It's hard to relate a physical experience to um, an experience that you equate within the mind. But that's, as an analogy goes, that's pretty close to what it is. Very, very subtle sense of something. Right. So we're listening for that. And uh, the other thing that we touched on yesterday was the historic reference of your own genetic association, right? which will bear 
um, a lot of fruit because all of us do have a genetic cellular makeup based on the human condition, right? which is handed down from generation to generation to generation. And my DNA is a product of my parents' DNA and my consciousness that inhabits it is uh, an adjustment to that continually, continually, continually in the drive to try and find individuality within a seemingly multiverse experience right but all of us have this thing we could trace it right back to the first man and the first woman if you wanted to look at it as an idea of uh, evolution but we all have specific um, markers specific points in history history historic references and stuff and one of the ones that I went through that I expressed yesterday was the, the sorry day one that we had in Australia here where the government made an apology to the Aboriginal people for the stolen generations, if you don't know um, what that was about, basically the Catholic Church interfered in Aboriginal culture and took away Aboriginal children from their parents because they figured that living in the dirt in the outback like they'd done for 80,000 years was no way for a kid to live. And they put all the kids into orphanages and gave them off to white families, right? It was horrendous. It was horrendous. And it was all kept very hush-hush from social consciousness for many, many years until the last, really, what, 30 years or so? You started to hear about it and murmurs of it. And then I met an Aboriginal woman who was one of these stolen generations, this older woman. And in my own process with that sorry day, I went through a whole bunch of allowing myself to feel um, what it was going back, you know, trying to, trying to figure out the mentality of somebody that would do that the mindset, because I'd come from that, right? Jesus says in the Bible, it's like um, the sins of the father will visit you into three generations, I think it is, right? Which means whatever your grandparents do or great grandparents do, the guilt or the whatever it is, the, the fear that they carry from that will be handed down genetically through three generations before it gets kind of purified out of the system again and you kind of reboot, right? But you can break the chain of that genetic link anytime you want to with forgiveness. Right? So looking into these, um, you wouldn't even call them indiscretions, they're horrors. In looking into these horrors of the past. If you were a German person, you would, you would have to look at um, the Nazi atrocities during the war and things like that. These are really powerful historic markers that bear a genetic coding in in consciousness you know none of it is reality but if you look at it you'll be able to find your own reactions to it and your reactions your emotional reactions to it are your triggers right so we tend to think of our lives as being these little 24 7 in my suburbs kind of home environment and we tend to skip over the fact that the, perhaps there might be this ancestral kind of genetic link going back 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 it's something we don't often think about right very rarely if ever Right. Oh, my grandmother was a, was a school teacher and my grandfather was a sailor in the Navy and that's about as far as it gets. You know? But to actually take responsibility as being one with the mind, one with that thing, and to just sit with it for a minute and to allow yourself to feel it. I felt when I, when I sat in that sorry day idea, apart from the fact that I thought it was a piss poor excuse of making an apology, really, like how do you apologise for that? But I sat in the idea of um, being a descendant of the race that perpetrated that atrocity on a whole other race of people, right? And I was disgusted. I was ashamed. It brought up all of this stuff. It brought up all of this. I didn't want to be a part of this race of people that I was born into. Like I was so ashamed, you know, like my great, great grandparents thought it was okay to take children from their parents because they didn't like the way they grew up, right? Now, there, there are still atrocities being performed in the world today, right? The world that I see is full of it. None of it has reality, but where is it that my blocks lie, right? In my own personal journey into fear, what is it that is going to unlock my own sense of guilt or unworthiness or anything? 
I've only got the stories that are that I'm aware of. I've only got the particulars of my 24-7 life. I can't just make something up, right? So whilst the past is gone and I don't want to dwell on it, it is useful as a catalyst for healing, okay? Like Port Arthur. Port Arthur in Australia was a massacre. It's like you guys in America, I know, have a lot of gun crime stuff. Our biggest one here in Australia was Port Arthur. What, 28 people or something were shot. 40 people. 40 people were shot dead. 39 or 38 or something. Yeah, by, by a gunman. And, um, no, well, he didn't do it. Yeah, apparently he, he didn't do it. He had the mentality of a, of a six-year-old or something. And he had he, schizophrenia and he's freaking, they threatened his mum. They said, we're going to... Yeah, all of that. Yeah. So, but it triggers a lot of stuff, right? Especially for people that live down around that area. Um, they don't like to talk about it. They don't like to talk about what happened. It's something that let's leave it in the past, let's bury it deep and pretend it kind of never happened. Right? And that's the same with everybody. You know, every race, every um, yeah, every every race really, and religion has always been at war and has always perpetrated crimes against other races, religions, and all sorts of things throughout human history, right? So one of the things that um, is helpful in this, because we're, we're in this um, coming together for the purpose of healing, is to look at all those things and see where you're really at with it. Like in, um, in English history, you know, there's the idea of the Vikings that came and slaughtered tens of thousands of Englishmen for gold and silver and all of that sort of stuff came down from the Nordic lands. It's like a whole warrior race. They basically grew up learning to fight, kill, whatever, to survive. And that's what they did mercilessly. They didn't even think about it. They rode their boats to somewhere else, killed everybody, took their land thing and all their possessions and lived happily ever after, not even blinking an eye about it and laughing all the way. You know, if that were to occur today, and in a sense it still does, but in a much more devious way, there'd be outcry. There'd be like the whole thing would just be so unacceptable. Right? But that unacceptability exists in each and every one of us in some context that we can relate to. And being willing to take that step to look at ancestral ties and ancestral links is a really powerful and really big opportunity, I guess, to really take a whole chunk of healing and like be honest with it. You know, we've got bigotry, racism, uh, gender um, stuff, especially today, gender stuff. Um, you name it, the list, of, the list of things goes on and on and on. And it's easy when you pick up the course to go, oh, it's just a dream, it's just an illusion, right? I'm God's son. But where am I really at with that? Like you guys know that when you read this 20-minute book, it brings stuff up. You get to see your own reflection right there in the words on the page of Jesus' example of a perfectly healed mind and you where you're at, and it causes a reaction, right? At a certain point when you get to, a, a kind of a certain level of healing, you'll be reading those same lessons and you won't react to it anymore because it no longer has any relevance. It doesn't ring true for you as something you need to know about. Okay. But until then, let's dig in deep and do the work. Right. I come from like my, my birthplace in the dream is England, you know, and I couldn't look at an Aboriginal person in the in the face, really, especially around that time of the sorry moment when the whole um, Anglo-Saxon whatever world in Australia apologised to the Aboriginal people. I felt more guilty than ever. Everything came to the surface. The whole story, the whole situation was exposed in the media. Everybody knew about it. Everybody um, was secretly ashamed of it and all backed the sorry movement and like wanted to apologize and everything like that. It's not like you can actually apologize for what happened 200 years ago, because like, it's not you, it's not your, it's not your own immediate thing, but you can look at and forgive those triggers that are exposed in your reactions to these things. Does that make sense? 
So that's what I want to kind of look at. You know, I read a book once about, um, and I've got a beautiful friend. His name's Wolf, and he's in my friends list. He's a Native American Indian man. He's, uh, I won't talk too much about his thing. I want to keep it more um, anonymous, but he's had an incredible emotional struggle with his identity, even in the framework of the, of the physical space. He's in and out of all sorts of um, situations where he's constantly atoning and forgiving for um, the misgivings of the white people against his people and taking the whole country away and everything like that, you know. And when I talk to him, he's incredibly passionate about it. He rings me up every now and again. He'll tell me where he's at with things. He's incredibly passionate about it. And in my own mind, I take that passion, I use it. And I offer that passion on behalf of him to the Holy Spirit. It's like, I'm not separate from my brother. It's like the idea of um, the story of Moses, the Exodus. That was a powerful one for me. It's like, I could see in me the wrong of what occurred in those days of forcing others to do the bidding of somebody just because they had power and the ability to control another group of people. You know, that was like such a, like, what the hell, just to build some pointy freaking stone things, you know, like, what, what's that about? And that righteousness, that God-given righteousness for liberty to be effective to, to a whole race to a whole community of people thousands and thousands of people that brought up a lot of impassioned kind of i guess you would say anger in a certain sense and just indignant righteousness like like who the fuck does these people think they are you know all that kind of energy but that's a huge package of energy that's a huge i could have ignored it i could have just pretend oh the book of exodus that was you know five thousand something years ago what does that matter doesn't affect me now of course not the past is always gone it doesn't exist but in the story of it there's a lot of contained energy for um for the advance of my own healing if that makes sense All right each of you's got the same thing Perpetrator, victim, victim, perpetrator, blah, blah, blah. It's the, it's the attack and defense story of the world, right? We tend to keep our finger on our nose here and just look at our own little neighborhood, whatever goes on. But it's like, try to let your man, mind expand out and take on board something else, right? Tina, you're on the cusp of a big shift, like a big shift. You keep coming up against it and going back, coming up against it and going back. And all I'm doing is telling you, Make a commitment to that. Try to get a sense of it within yourself and actually commit to it as if you were like, I don't know. Jesus talks about it as being a crusader. Think of yourself as like a crusader. This is the last crusade. But I think something more contemporary would be more like a human rights activist or something like that. Try to think of it as someone who... Um, sees the wrongs and feels the wrongs of the world. Right. Let that happen. Let that let let all that come up. It's incredibly valuable. If there's something there, there's something there. If there's not, there's not. But you'll know. Right? One of the things I like to do, or not not now, I haven't been to the library here, but when I was down in Byron Bay, they had a little community library. And I used to like to go and just look through the books. I'd have nothing to do. I was unemployed. I, there was a couple of hours in the day where there'd be um ted wouldn't be talking and we'd just have free time to go to a coffee shop or whatever and the library was sort of in the side street but it was on the way into town to where our favorite little coffee shops were and sometimes i'd just go in there and i'd sit for 10 15 minutes and just be human i'd just read totally read something just a few pages out of a book that wasn't the course in miracles you know it never really made sense i look back now and i think i wonder why i did that but in my mind, somewhere subconsciously, I was searching for catalysts. I was searching for triggers. I was searching for something that was going to activate me and expose a point of view I had 
for or against something going on in the world. Whether that was historic or current, doesn't really matter. Anticipated in the future, doesn't really matter. All time is happening in me now. Okay. That mindset, that way of thinking of the people that's the stolen generations in our country here, that mindset in those days to those people was perfectly acceptable. You couldn't have told them it was the wrong thing to do. They would have swore black and blue they were acting on behalf of the best interests of the children. Right? Out of an idea of love, a misguided idea, obviously, but a mis out of an idea of love. Nowadays, you couldn't do that. that. That just wouldn't pass the litmus test. It would be seen as insanity. Right? But it shows you how much the collective consciousness has shifted in 200 years from what was acceptable to now what's not acceptable. It's like a few days ago, I put up a post referencing abortion. right? And then I woke up this morning and I'm looking at my feed on Facebook and there's all this stuff in America that some abortion law has changed and now it's, uh, what is it, illegal for an abortion or something now? But California is going to make sure that it's not illegal and they're going to stand against it, right? So, which I'm all, I'm all pro-choice on, in, on anything, like live and let live, you know, like do what you want to do. It's your journey and you get the results of your own thinking. But that collective consciousness is suddenly witnessed to in all of these posts, like it's not just one or two, it's tons, tons and tons of tons. And those ideas are going to spread throughout the collective consciousness of that country, at least, um, like wildfire. Right? It was the same when Donald Trump was elected. The whole world felt this collective conscious shift. And I don't really have a bearing on who's a better president or a worse, none of that stuff. But there was something that shifted when he was elected. The same way that there was something that shifted in the collective conscious when the 9-11 thing happened, right? When the thing's happening in Russia now, something's gone in the collective consciousness. It seems to be over there, out of the way. But there's a shift in consciousness, consciousness and you can feel it. You can tap into it because you are one with it, right? Whether that happened in history or whether that happened, you know, I've had, like in Australia here, we take the piss out of everything pretty much. We used to, right? Nowadays, our, and take the piss means to make fun of something, right? And try to make a lighthearted way of it. Nowadays, there's this kind of leftist sort of thing where people, it's not so much fun to take the fun out of everything or you're not supposed to. And, you know, political correctness, that's what I'm trying to find. And we used to make fun out of, blonde women and people with a disability and uh, what other we used to do immigrants and it. it was but it was a joke and it was a way of bridging the gap that the differences seem to present wogs. right yeah wogs italian people when all the, when all the italians come came over we called them wogs maltese. right the maltese and they come to australia we called them wogs and now they're proud of that name they call themselves wogs right but at, the, at, at first it was kind of a joke and a not an insult so much, but uh, I guess it was designed to let them know that we knew they were different from us, you know, but they're still included, but you're still a wog. You're not an Aussie because you weren't born here, that sort of mentality. It's a very thick kind of redneck mentality, but everybody tries to make fun of it, but everybody still gets along perfectly. You know, Australia is probably the biggest multicultural country in the world, and I don't really think there's much racism here, is there? Not really. Every, every, everyone laughs about everybody's differences rather than holds a holds a perspective of offense about things because somebody's different we just all get on but um i'm sure there are pockets of things here and there but in general but it's taken a long time i remember when our country adopted a multi-racial multi um whatever policy in the early 80s I think it started after the Vietnam War when we had an influx of Vietnamese that were escaping the communist uh, thing and we were taking tens and tens of thousands of Vietnamese people that wanted to flee Vietnam. Most people in Australia had never seen a Vietnamese person before, let alone any other kind of Asian person. We'd seen Aboriginals, Islanders, Greeks. We've got one of the biggest Greek communities. But it triggered a lot of stuff. A lot of people sat back and went, what more immigrants? like our country's going to run out of room or something, like it's ridiculous, you know. 
<laughs> with the biggest nation in the world. So there's room for everybody here. But it triggered this mentality that shot through the collective consciousness. It was on media, TV. People were making jokes about it. Our national TV celebrity was a guy called Paul Hogan, Crocodile Dundee. He used to have a show called The Hogue Show. He would make fun of the wogs. He'd make fun of the, the Hispanics, everybody, as a way of making them feel welcome, as a way of making them know that they are Aussies. We take, we take the piss out of ourselves as well, like regular just redneck Aussies, right? We laugh at ourselves. But that was our way of introducing new cultures, and it became their collective consciousness then. They knew that if we were making jokes about them, that we were okay with them, right? And they would start making jokes back at us about Aussies, and then we'd be two thumbs up. Yeah, you get it. You know, like you've, you've, got, the, you've got the flow. You've got the rhythm, what we're about here. We all take the piss out of each other and have fun together and uh, make jokes about our differences. But there are places where that's not funny, right? Historic places. There are places where where when you made a comment about somebody in the past about their ethnic, ethnicity or their gender or their whatever, it would take, be taken very offensively. People weren't learning to laugh at their differences. They, they weren't interested in laughing at things and laughing it off that we were different. Nowadays, if we have an issue with anything, we try to make a joke out of it as a way of dealing with it because we don't know, you know, until forgiveness comes along through the course and stuff like that, we don't know how else to deal with it. How do you deal with it? You either push it down or you make a joke about it, laugh it off, and then get on with it anyway. Right? But these emotions and these thoughts seem to pop in out of nowhere. Where the fuck do my thoughts come from? Where the hell? Who put all this stuff in my head that tells me this is good and that's bad? Right? So you don't know how to deal with it. And in a collective sense, the, the global consciousness representing my mind, representing my thoughts about things, there are examples of dealing badly with situations that mirrored uh, differences in the past, you know, different ways of living, different uh, dietary things, perhaps different religious beliefs, you name it. People go to war about freaking anything. It's ridiculous. You know, just look what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. What the hell's that about? Does anyone really know? You know, People will go to war against, it's like we have a saying here that Aussies like to bet and we'll, we'll bet on two flies sitting on a wall. You know, is that the saying? Oh, oh, we'll, we'll place a bet on two flies crawling up a wall. You know, we don't know why the hell we would do that, but we will. <laughs> right? But people react to anything. Right? Historically, there are these marker points in history where there have been abominations as well as good things you know like uh, what do you call that stuff penicillin and things and everybody goes oh yeah finally penicillin someone invented it well done Marie Curie you know and uh, um, the light bulb and everybody suddenly out of gas and they're like oh thank fuck for the light bulb you know and collect in the collective consciousness there are all these massive sighs of relief at the advance of technology and the advance of medicine and stuff but there are also these horrors there are also these things that we want to try and forget. Now, in what we're doing, we want to forget them as well. But we can't just forget them. We have to forgive them, right? Historically, within ourselves, somewhere, we have a genetic link to these things. In the collective consciousness, it gets handed down whether we're aware of it or not. Right? So making a decision. All right, I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to look at a history book. I'm going to see what my history truly holds in store for me and see if there's any triggers there or see if I've truly forgiven it, right? You have to make experiments with your spirituality. You have to make, like this whole thing is, it says in the beginning of the blue book, welcome to a great experiment, right? I remember um, Sri Aurobindo said, you have to make bold experiments with your faith, bold experiments with your spirituality. Step outside the box. Look at things that aren't your regular stuff. You know, explore consciousness, open it all up. Now, no one's going to like to do that, right? Nobody really wants to look at the emotional load that may be hiding there in the dark. But if you don't look at it, it's going to continue to hide there in the dark, right? In this technology, with this, uh, pardon me, 
with the Holy Spirit and with everything else that we've got at our hand in our grasp now, we can look at anything. You know, I saw a horrible thing the other day on um, uh, YouTube about 500,000 kids go missing in America every year. That's half a million kids, right? That's 500 schools worth of kids over here. 500, our, each of our schools here has on average 1,000 kids. That's 500 whole schools of kids that go missing. Where the hell do they go? What happens to them? Right? That's an astounding thing. It's out of the Bureau of Statistics. There are 500,000 reports of missing children every single year. Like if I sit in that idea, what happens to those kids? Maybe some of them just run away from home. They don't want to be found. Um, maybe some of them are abducted. Maybe some get eaten by grizzly bears. Maybe some whatever in the forest. I don't know what animals you have there, but things can happen, can happen, can happen. But in my own mind, I have this idea that kids ought to be protected, right? Kids ought to be nurtured, protected in this whole thing. And that there's a great failing somewhere in a society that allows 500,000 kids every year to go missing. I know it's a huge country, and whatever, but it's just one thing. And there was a trigger for me in that. I sat with it and it's like, that's fucked up, right? But I've sat with other things. I've sat with these school shootings and things that go on over there and I can't find any emotional trigger in there at all. It's just like, well, you know, if you let people have guns, you got to expect gun crime and stuff like that. It's kind of like part and parcel. It's like you fiddle around with genetic material in a laboratory in uh, Wuhan and you got to expect that perhaps some of it might get out into the population. You know, it's to be expected really. But when people just go missing and there's no explanation, when things, when crimes are perpetrated on a whole race for some ridiculous reason that makes no sense to anybody, it's like there are triggers there for me. You know, I look at those things and I feel it. I let myself go into it, feel it and offer it up to the Holy Spirit, even though it may not be something tangible in my 24-7 suburban experience of myself here and now. Right? I used to put on the TV and I'd watch the kids in Africa in the 80s during the famine and they'd be starving. Their ribs would be sticking out and their stomachs would be all um, ballooned out from malnutrition, dying. 11,000 babies a day were dying. 11,000 babies. Emotionally, that crushed me. That's what brought me to God. And I still feel it. Like, it's just such a ridiculous, you know, I hated the world. I hated all the governments of the world. I hated all the people that were doing nothing. And it took for Bob Geldof to stand up and go, hey, we're going to do live aid for Africa and we're going to bring everyone's attention to this situation. Yeah, it was corrupted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it got a bit corrupted. But, but Bob Geldof was my hero, you know, in that whole unfathomable situation where it seemed like no one could do anything. It's like, how can we get a million shiploads of food to Africa before the dawn of the next morning when another 11,000 kids are going to die. You know, it was impossible. It was like there was no logistical way to sort of stem the tide because not enough people were really truly connecting with what was actually happening. They were seeing it on their TVs and just, oh, look at the weather outside, you know, in their own mind, changing the channel. And then when, the, when something else would come on that they wanted to watch, they'd watch that but they would ignore the elephant in the room. And Bob Geldof galvanised the whole country, a whole nation, a whole world to the problem and got it fixed. People started piling in money, donations, whatever. Boats went, food got sent, seeds, water, everything got organised and the famine was slowly kind of like, you know. But there was a massive, that was a massive catalyst for me. I felt so helpless. That was happening. In, that wasn't a historic one. That was happening while I, while I was sitting here eating my three meals a day. I couldn't stand to look at the food on my plate. It, it hurt me so deeply knowing that I didn't need this food and this food could probably help save the lives of like three little kids over there that would just, you know. So look at it. Look at those references. 
find your own stuff. It's like make the effort to reach outside the box, go and have fish and chips on the side of the street and just do something different. Right? It's when you step outside of your safety net, when you step outside of that regular parameters of experience that you think um, defines your spiritual progress and whatever, whatever. It's like more gets added. More gets added. Right? Go climb a mountain. Go do whatever it is that you feel in your heart you need to do. Don't necessarily listen to me about particular things. I mean, you may already know that there's probably a catalyst buried in you for some healing that you don't want to look at regarding something other than what I'm talking about. Right? But make the effort. Go and look at it, whatever it takes. I used to like going into the library and look at things because uh, even though I often didn't find anything, like there was just a sense of connecting with um, the world in a way where when I was reading the course, I felt sort of, in a sense, disconnected from the world. I felt like it was this cocoon of safety that I'd been given for a moment and that everything else was put on hold while I was doing the lessons. But I used to go, when I was in Byron Bay, I was there six years full time with Ted. But every now and again, I would have to go and visit my family. Right, Once or twice a year, I'd go and visit my family, take a, a few days off or a week off, and they'd be about three hours up the road. And when I would go there, it was, I know it was my family, but it was almost shattering to be there because that safety in that, in that cocoon of everyone believing the same thing, practicing the same thing and talking about the same thing in Byron Bay was gone. And I was forced to look at where I was with things actually in the world rather than where I was sort of like keeping myself in this bubble of spiritual security, right? And you don't realize you're doing that. It just, you just kind of build it up around yourself and the 20-minute the book becomes kind of like your safety net and um, these Zoom meetings and other things become like this kind of spiritual safety net, which is great. Use it until you don't need it anymore. But also, don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. Look at stuff. And for me, those historic references are a huge catalyst. They're a huge trigger for healing. They bear a lot of weight and produce a lot of fruit. But do it, if you're going to do it, do it when you feel to do it. Do it when you're ready. But just know that there's going to be healing there. And Tina, for you, I know that there's something in you that's like you've been coming up against again and again and again. So I'm going to push you to step outside your comfort zone for a bit. Just keep asking, keep asking. Show me, Lord, show me. I remember Ted, Ted railing on me once at the... <laughs> It was both devastating and at the same time good in front of everybody in the lunchroom, in the lunch area out, outside about, um, I went through a period of having um, little sexual conquests with a lot of the women at the healing centre, or well, not a lot, but three or four, one after the other after the other, just because I was going through this energetic period of feeling incredibly masculine for a moment, like feeling incredibly empowered as a masculine entity, which I don't have anymore. I feel completely devoid of it now. But for a moment there, all this energy came up and I externalized it. I, I didn't know what was going on. It was like all of a sudden I was 18 again and there were women everywhere and the world was my oyster. And all of this energy came up and Ted called me out on it in front of like 50 people in the lunchroom in the lunch area so everyone could hear and I felt like this big like it was <laughs> it was terrible I saw what I was actually doing but I was blind until it was pointed out to me I was blind to it I would have probably kept on doing that for another 10,000 years I was blind to what was going on in my consciousness I thought that I was being friendly and nice and uh, sharing my love around you know to anyone who wanted it in in a physical way but it wasn't that at all i was trying to use and abuse what i could get out of the the energy of what was being presented and like a bull in a china shop wreaking a trail of havoc and bringing up all this um causing all this damage you know it was really quite brutal and i couldn't see it i had to be pointed it out 
And I put my finger on my nose and I went in my cabin and prayed. And I, man, I was in there. I must have cried for about an hour and prayed and prayed and prayed. And something shifted, something shifted. But it took for Ted to really, and Ted was a big guy. He was like towered over me. And like when he was really impassioned about making you want to hear something, you didn't dare say boo. You know, <laughs> you stood there and you just took it. But, uh, I saw him hit Lockie once in, in session. Lockie, Lockie confronted him about something and Ted just stood up out of his thing and just went bam and slapped him right across out of his chair about something. And that was a big moment. A lot of guys left the healing centre then because their ideas of what Ted ought to be and how he should conduct himself were shattered. And Lockie left for a little while and then he came back and realised that that's what it took to get him to see what he was doing, which was a similar thing. Like everything's included in this. Just because we call it spiritual doesn't mean that all of a sudden we behave in a more um, holy manner or stuff. It's like, no, we, we come to this with all our lumps and bumps. You put 50 people with their egos all undergoing transformation in a room together for any length of time, it gets ugly. It gets really ugly. There's arguing and bitching and everybody's, and everybody's egos gets exposed. Right? That's the whole purpose. We're not here to be nice and play nice spiritual, aren't we all good now and all of that. We're here to look at our shit. We're here to bring it up to the surface so it can be healed. Right? And sometimes you need a catalyst. A lot of the times you need a catalyst. Sometimes it's obvious that you have maybe issues around jealousy or issues around greed or poverty or all of these sorts of things. And these are all pretty obvious you can admit to them quite easily and you can see them in the reflections of your relationships with others but sometimes they're historic things and you don't you're not really aware of them you're not aware of uh, why you are how you are why people treat you differently in circum certain circumstances in certain circles so when i went on holiday for my honeymoon to vietnam in the north i was looked at like a monster by the older generations who'd experienced the war. They associated me immediately with the Americans, um, with the war, with uh, the loss of their loved ones and everything else like that. In the South, I was perceived as a, a bit of a, a savior, like a hero. I represented the guys, the good guys that came to save them from the Chinese and the Russians. You know, It was a country divided, but the perception of me, I'm, I had to say to this woman, Australian, Australian, because they hate Americans, right, in the North, absolutely detest Americans. And, um, but they like Australians for some reason, right? And I had, to, I had to make it known that I was Australian, right? Apparently, Australians treated them fairly well and like equals and whatever, and the Americans kind of like trashed their country and brought in the really big heavy weapons and caused a lot of damage. But the perception of who is the good guy and who is the bad guy vary from one end of the country to the other. You go to the north, you're the, you're the villain. You go to the south, you're the hero. They love Americans, Australians, and everybody in the south, but up the north, it's a frosty welcome. Yeah. But all of that brings up triggers. All of that brings up a catalyst. I was just there as a tourist, and unbeknownst to me, thrust into the collective consciousness of Vietnam's association with what my image represents. To them i couldn't turn around and run away you know i had to own it i had to totally own it it's like i understand how you feel i had an old lady spit me in the face like in the street in in hanoi like she made a point of coming across the street standing in front of me and going <laughs> and spit me right in the face a little old lady in her 80s I knew she was coming over to see me for some reason. I didn't realise she was going to spit me in the face. <laughs> and Rosie, my wife at the time, who is also Asian, she just laughed. The old lady wasn't concerned about her at all. But because of how I look, I was instantly associated with in a certain manner and judged against and the whole thing. And I didn't want to defend myself. I wanted to bless that old lady because I knew immediately I knew immediately what she'd been through. I felt it. I had this whole empathetic kind of empathic. I just knew. I would have stood there 
and let her spit me in the face all day long if it made her feel better. You know? But I knew inside her heart was breaking and seeing me just brought up those horrible, sad memories of loss and pain and death. And I had to own that. All of us have that in us somewhere. It's encoded in us. It's like part of our bloody story. And we're here to expose the story and we're here to heal the story. So that's either what we're about or it's not what we're about. I like to be about it. I like to get into the activation of things. I like to really dig and try to find stuff and sit with it. And I mean, there's probably stuff I'm not aware of now that, I mean, I'm still here. I still find myself on the planet. There's still obviously healing I need to do. There's still obviously acts of forgiveness that I need to be about. They don't seem to be so obvious to me anymore. As you go on, they become more and more subtle. It's like I'm looking forward to selling this house and moving on to the next thing and seeing what all of that change of events and circumstances brings up. These, these moments, these, uh, they are opportunities. These moments, are like they can be profound. They're like these suddenly these huge historic blocks of stuff, and you don't even realize how deep it goes. You know? But you're doing it for your whole world, the past and the future. Jesus says that the miracle affects those who you may not even be aware of, those that you don't even know that are not even in your vicinity and those that are not even born yet. It's like the work that you do in you to heal your triggers and your catalysts has a far-reaching effect in consciousness beyond your awareness. It's like nobody, nobody likes to take a journey into fear. No one. But yet we've all signed up for it. <laughs> We're the crazy ones. <laughs> we all signed up and said, yes, Jesus, we're going to give up the world and follow you. So, but don't forget when, you do, when you're doing these things, also take your rest. Take your rest. It's like any crusader, like anyone who's on a pilgrimage. You can't just walk all the time. You've got to stop. You've got to rest. You've got to find the joy and the peace and the happiness again for a moment and then go on. You know? All right, what's next, Jesus? What's next? I see that I've healed this. I see that I've forgiven that. I'm going to rest for a minute, take a breath, on to the next thing. When you're ready, your awakening keeps pace with you. Yep. Tina? Tina? Um, since you're, uh, I, you know, I know you're excited about Mary, but my, one of the stones I stepped on was the gospel of Thomas before I come across Mary. So I just thought I'd say those words to you. It's only like a 20 minute read or something. The gospel of Thomas, you can, I've got it on my phone. It's a free, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just Jesus said, and just statements but i stepped on that stone so a friend said oh gospel of thomas two people said a gospel of tom one person said a gospel of thomas and then i'm and then i bumped into another friend and they mentioned the gospel of thomas and something in my mind went click and i read a gospel of thomas and then which gospel of thomas was discovered in um, 1945 and then i read mary baker and mary baker's words are the gospel of Thomas, but she <laughs> was discovered. 
So, so, so I'm reading Mary Baker after I read the Gospel of Thomas, and I'm going, wow, 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 and just it was all together, and it's all our Savior's words. It's so beautiful and moving. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Maybe there's something there for you. Yeah, thank you, because that does, when you just said that. I've not read the Gospel of Thomas, but I've heard people mention my feedback. Um, so Mary, yeah, we, can get, we can download it. I've got, um, a, I've got um, a bookmark on my phone. So I just go through it and, you know, um, you know, Jesus talks a bit. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll just love, have, love have, a, have a look at it. It's just um, maybe there's something there. No, I'm, thank you so much. Cause I've heard people talk about the gospel of Thomas and I don't know why I've never thought to read it. Um, so the Mary thing is not my thing. That's Heidi's thing. So yeah, I appreciate Heidi. you saying that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I'm going to do it immediately. Thank yeah, you. well. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, appreciate that. I can't believe you don't have the Gospel of Thomas. Go I can't believe I don't either. You know, it's weird. I don't have it. It is weird. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, it's, I just bookmarked it. It's only thousand words or something and uh well not even i don't know i marked it on my phone and i just go to it and it's beautiful thank you, thank you. <laughs> and what's going on with you You're on moot. I feel like my ex-husband is trying to draw me back into communicating with him. Is he passed over into the next life or is he still in this one? <laughs> oh, yeah, he's texting me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a catalyst. Well, it certainly is. You know, it doesn't take a lot. Yeah. You'd have a lot of emotional uh, references there for uh, that relationship, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's just, I've, you know, I haven't heard from him for about two months. And just tonight, he's sending me photographs of food that he's cooked. You know, and telling me how... Great, his cooking's coming along and like so random. Right, good, random. I feel Little myself box. being pulled in, you know, pulled in. Right, good, let yourself feel it. Let yourself feel it. How does it feel? If you can feel something, it's because you've already given it a meaning. You've already given it some sort of value. I have. I can't stop loving the guy, even though he treats me, you know, really good, really shit. That's how you treat yourself. <laughs> you got to you got to remember that your external relationships are reflections of your internal one. Sometimes you love yourself. Sometimes you don't you're going to get those references outside of you and the people who are often closest to you play the part the most obvious. Everything. There's not a moment that God's voice doesn't call upon my forgiveness to save me. Everything is a catalyst. Everything is an opportunity to forgive. It doesn't mean that you communicate with him or don't communicate with him, but it means you look at what's going on in you now that that situation's come up, it's like, all right, I need to give this to the Holy Spirit. I, I see that I have a whole emotional package here, which is being activated and triggered. I don't know what to do with it, but I'm willing to forgive all my thoughts about it because Jesus is telling me there is no world. <laughs> it's just more grist for the mill. And remember that the purpose of all relationships is to make them holy. 
this is an opportunity for you to look at that relationship and make it holy. Now, obviously, you don't know how to do that. Because if you did, you would have done it already. Right? But it's an opportunity for you to draw your circle and to sit in that energy, to sit in that whole conundrum, that whole thing outside the box of what it, you know, that random feeling. You're feeling this is so random, to sit in that and allow it to be exposed in you what that is. It's all good stuff seen rightly. You may not like it energetically, but once you do it, once you get through it, it's done. It doesn't have to show up again. And whether you have a spiritual perspective on life or not, um, people go through emotional shit in relationships. Most of them go through it and don't know what to do with it, so they run away. They end the relationship rather than heal whatever seems to be the, um, the abrasive sort of situation that, that comes up in it. But if you, can, if you can take it from me for a second or take it on board for yourself that um, there's nothing that comes to you that is not by the grand design. There's no coincidences. And in a certain sense, then, there's nothing random about him contacting you again after all that time. Somewhere you've asked him to play that part. You've asked him to text you and send him pictures and messages and things like that. So you can now have something else in your heart and mind to look at as an idea of forgiveness. That doesn't mean anything other than forgiveness. Right? The mind naturally wants to go to, well, if I forgive him, does that mean we have to get back together? If I forgive him, do I suddenly become friends with him? If I forgive, no, just forgive and then leave it. Right? Don't decide what to do with forgiveness. Once you forgive, then the next thing will show up. But the ego always wants to like jump in and go, I don't know if I'm ready to forgive that because if I forgive that, it might be too soon and there might be some unwritten expectation there that uh, I'm afraid of. You know? All these sorts of things. I'm just making stuff up, but all these sorts of things occur in relationships. People get together and fall apart and get together and fall apart for all sorts of crazy reasons. Right? But in this energy... Forgiveness is the hub of healing for whatever those crazy reasons were that we think that we have to suddenly separate ourselves from somebody because we're only attempting to separate ourselves from ourselves. My enemy is in here, not out there. The person I'm angry at is me, not that brother or that sister or whatever, that situation. I'm angry at myself. I'm projecting it onto somebody else. They have to play the part then of representing my anger because mind is whole. As above, so below. Mind is whole on earth as in heaven. God's will is done here. I can't escape the effects of my thinking. Doesn't matter if I project it out there. But if I project it out onto somebody else, that person's this, that person's that, rather than looking at it in my mirror, right? It may take some time for that reflection to come back around. It's a bit of a waste of time because in this modality of healing, we're here to collapse time. We're here to speed things up and get this done. Nobody wants to be sitting for 30 years in a Zoom meeting looking at ideas of healing that they could have done in, you know, a couple of months or a year, 365 lessons. So let's get this shit done and then get on with our lives as free-minded sort of beings able to carry the light with us, knowing that we have the tools and the capacity to actually apply these principles to everything that comes up. And that's going to be, that'll be an ongoing thing. If it was some, if it was someone you didn't know, some guy that was like across the street sending you pictures of his cooking and talking to you or whatever, you'd probably feel slightly different about it. You'd probably think, oh, look at this. There's my neighbor across the road. We don't talk much, but now he's suddenly sending me, that's nice. I'll send him my recipes. You'd probably have a whole different perspective on things. Yeah. But because it's someone that you've already allocated a meaning to as being my ex, whatever, whatever, it's going to trigger stuff. Right? 
So we're going to do a little circle because I remember you said to me the other day that, uh, oh, we don't do, I haven't done a light circle or something. And I'm sure you have, but we're going to do one today, just a little one. Okay. And I want you to bring that whole package if you can, right? You may not even yet be aware of it. You may not even be aware of how deep it runs, whatever. But that's the purpose of stepping into the circle. We step there, we identify the problem and give it to the Holy Spirit. And we wait for that emotionality to be lifted, to be healed. We wait for that little shift. Or it might be a big shift. It depends on the, on the weight of the emotions that are involved and the meaning you've given. It's kind of a good one. It's juicy. But, you know, you only have, you only have um, as opportunities to deal with stuff you only have the relationships that you're aware of really you know the ones that are fresh and and juicy for you like your ex-husband your ex whatever your kids things like that if you dig into history you'll find some other ones that are maybe not so apparent on the surface but the ones on the surface they're easy to deal with because like they're in your face (laughs) in your face you can't get away from them like, God damn it, another text from my ex-husband. I thought I was done with that shit. <laughs> Whatever. Let it be juicy. Let it be juicy. Don't try to dumb it down and pretend it doesn't affect you. If it affects you, it affects you. Be honest about it. Right? That honesty is going to reveal a whole bunch of emotional crap, which is what you want. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for that stuff. Where am I tethered? Where are my blocks? Where is my judgment and my grievances and all of this sort of stuff, my stories? It's good. It's good stuff. And, and the, the, the proof of the pudding for the healing, of course, is, forget, is uh, gratitude. Wow, thanks for playing that part for me. But if you can look at that, if you can look at that person's situation or event and just identify it, I, us, I usually like to just try and give it one word, you know, pettiness or jealousy or envy or gluttony, the seven deadly sins or whatever it is to you, right? I like to give it one word and go, aha, that's me. I wouldn't even know what I was looking at out there unless it was a thought system act of my own mind. There's something in my own mind that relates to it, associates with it. It's part of my genetic association. I need to own it because it's not true. It's not my reality. My reality is spirit. Okay. You got anything else going on? You haven't punched anyone out this week? (laughs) No. That was a funny story. I like that one. <laughs> At least you had the guts to do it. <laughs> Gemma, Gemma Jones, action figure. Hey. Hey. You all good? Yeah. Yeah, it's just um, I've had so sort of two things um, hearing you talk about um searching for like triggers and things that um a catalyst um there's something around that and then there's something that a thread that keeps coming up for me around it seems insignificant now especially after those lessons it just <laughs> seems like it's so funny because I just know it's not true so I've kind of seen through that one and it's around like offending people that I'm res- like responsible for upsetting people and that I'm gonna I don't know if you know what it is like being judged or I can't even feel it now because it just kind of seems right. really significant right it may come around again yeah the ego is uh, very good at, at disguising it and pushing it away and like you know and then you'll be like I've had many times where I've sort of had something on the periphery and I'm like, what is that? I know there's, there's something there, can't really find it. And then boom, it'll just show up again in another way. And like automatically I try to grab a hold of it. And sometimes it's very slippery, like a fish, you know, and it just sort of like, 
disappears and you can't seem to grab a hold of it for healing. It's like somebody hiding in the shadows. Mm. Yeah, I did spend a bit of time. I did process some of it yesterday, a lot of like heaving and stuff like that and retching and things. So, and then just the muffins like filled, (laughs) just made it so insignificant. But the other thing that's come up since you've been, I can feel it now. Right. Yep. Go on. Just let me see if I can get it out. Um, So, I saw on one of like the A Course in Miracles sites that a person mentioned about um, using TV, like you've been saying, and movies um, for these catalysts. And I've not really one for TVs and movies, but um, me and my partner have kind of been through a whole transition and uh, we started watching stuff together. And we watched the Sex Pistols um like remake Danny Boyle stuff that's out the minute. It's freaking awesome. Um, but there's some child abuse scenes in it. Um, and I, I got so it was, you know, it was upsetting. It was, it was quite triggering and watched it and it was fine. And then I, I went to bed and I realized I'm like, oh, what is that? And so I just sat with it for a minute and I realized that it was. It was so I just let whatever it was come up, some emotionality. And then there was something around like forgiving the perpetrator, forgiving the, the pedophile in it. And it, there was something I knew that that's kind of because in seeing mm, their innocence or their abused parts or something around all of this and there seems to be something around that that, that's been around for I don't know a a couple of months maybe and I don't know what that is and just hearing you talk tonight is kind of like I need to dive into that um yeah your heart's starting to open your heart open like really open When your heart starts to open, you feel the suffering of humanity so bad. You feel it. You become total, totally empathetic to what people go through, all sorts of stuff. You can't help it. You just find yourself crying at the drop of a hat. And it was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I need to do some, yeah, digging around in there, around all of that. You know, when well, yeah. just sit in it. Just sit in it. You've already done the digging around. You can already see the catalyst. Okay. Right. The digging around has exposed the tip of an iceberg. There. Right. When we do our circle, just take that with you into the circle and sit in it. Offer it to the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go. You don't have to go. This is right. So this is a really important thing to understand, because otherwise you'll become doubly fearful of making any kind of confrontation. You don't. Have to go into the um, depths of any particular story about something. Once you can feel the emotionality of it, you can give that to the Holy Spirit because you've put cause and effect together, right? The Holy Spirit's not asking you to sit there and go through the entire um, mental imaging and whatever of the situation that you're upset by, if you were raped or abused or... um, somebody else has been or any of that sort of stuff right that's not that's not what healing asks healing asks is that you be willing to let the holy spirit do it for you okay the holy spirit will look upon it for you already and say to you sort of like Gemma, there's a trigger here for you all you got to do is be willing to look at it with me i'll do the rest okay. right? but you but you have to stand in your circle and let him do Pardon me. Let him do the rest. Let all, let that all come up, right? Your mind will be tempted to make a story up about it, but that doesn't mean that's exactly what the story is. Like we had a we had a um, yesterday yesterday what's today Sunday it's Friday on on Facebook. Somebody in one of our you know you have these buy and sell pages where you can sell stuff, right? On Facebook community pages. You can sell your old couches and fridges, whatever. And we also have crime pages, crime watch page, like for our local thing. So if somebody's car gets stolen, they put a picture of it on there and all that sort of stuff. 
and somebody had posted a picture of the urinal, the men's urinal at the Black's Beach Tavern. Black's Beach is about probably 40 minutes from here, from my place. And it's known as, or it used to be known as a bit of a drug addicted roughneck kind of suburb. Somebody had posted a picture of the urinal and someone had spray painted on it, kids for sale right, on the urinal. And somebody had been in there, taken a photo of that and posted it up on this page and uh, put a little blurb about it, warning pedophiles operating in Black's Beach, probably blah, 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 and just be aware, watch your kids and all this sort of thing. Some concerned parent, I guess, right? Somebody else got on there and said, this is not the right page for that. You should take this post down, blah, blah, blah. This is a buy and sell page. We don't want it to become a crime page and all this sort of thing. And my thinking on it was don't take it down, right? It's like it's turned up at this on this page for a reason, this, this warning or this alert or this trigger for perhaps many people. Don't take it down because it's like the idea that I would want to push that aside and pretend it's not happening or this isn't the appropriate place for something like that. You know, in my mind, there's never not a place that's not appropriate for um, exposing something, right, some corruption whether it's child crime, violent crime, uh, white collar crime, you know, they're all representing erroneous thought system patterns in my own mind, erroneous thought system packages, right? So you get one. I don't know who did the spray paint. I don't know who the kids are. I don't know any of the story other than my little bit there where I said to this guy, dude, if you took that down and a kid went missing, and that could have been prevented by just, even if it is in the wrong spot, you know, it's like the reasonability of, of how I saw it for me said, just leave it there, right? Let it be, right? But I'm recognised that I was looking at my own um, officious mind thing that said, oh yeah, that shouldn't be on this page. That should be on another page, right? Trying to organise the deck chairs on the Titanic based on some trigger that had happened. And I was kind of triggered by it a little bit. I thought, what the hell? This is in my town. You know, we we're only a small town. Not we don't get much stuff. I don't think we've had any. Hemi, Hemi Goodwin, Hemi. Little Hemi, little little eighteen month old boy was murdered by his babysitter a while back, and that shook the whole town. But yeah, um, haven't you heard about that? No, Hemi Goodwin. Hmm. I'll tell you later. Might be a good catalyst for you. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't laugh at him. Sorry, Hemi. <laughs> But, I was just um, thinking, I read those words that what he's trying to say in the Gospel of Thomas was right. somewhere very recently, and it was worded beautifully about how Jesus said, if you witness something, that you've got to warn them. But he, but he put it right. in a way simple. I, like I read it once and I thought, oh, bing. Because you're your brother's keeper. You yeah. are your brother's keeper. That looks like anything. That takes on every aspect. Right. So you're watching something, you get triggered automatically your response as a healer is to be your brother's keeper. Automatically, your heart opens. You want to love. You want to nurture. You want to invite the whole world in and hold it in your arms, especially when it's those that are the more innocent and the more vulnerable. You feel it even more deeply because it relates to ideas of innocence and vulnerability, right? Which in your heart and your mind, you know is the truth of you. It's like my, in my relationship with God, my innocence and my invulnerability depend upon my relationship being intact. And I weep at the loss of it in my own mind. Right? I see that everywhere out in the world. I'm literally walking through my relationship with God in everything. Sometimes that's devastating and sometimes it's really joyous. It's like we did a beautiful session here yesterday up in the, the room up there, me and Dean and Vinka. And the three of us, just like we couldn't stop laughing and, and rolling around on the floor. And it was just like divine. The whole thing was just divine and beautiful. But the three of us also went through the undergoing of a moment of devastation, which all that laughing and rolling around was on the other side of. It's like that lesson, that lesson in the 20-minute book, you know, I want to relinquish these thoughts that were made to take the place of my real thoughts. When I relinquish them and my real thoughts are there, 
I laugh and I'm happy because I'm joyous to suddenly have found again that link with my father, that place where truth resonates in me again. It's like, whoo, I can rest in that truth. It's like, hallelujah, there I am, found again in my own thing. <sighs> Let me rest. <laughs> it's a great weight off the shoulders. You know, it's beautiful. You can feel it. <sighs> And then we go on again and go on again and go on again. Now you're in, you're in a bit of a lucky situation or, or a perfect situation, I should say, with your monastery work. You know, you could probably find someone there to um, put yourself on the receiving end of instead of being the listener, be the talker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got very, very lucky. Got a right. yeah, do exchanges and got people like literally at the you know right. end of the text message and the phone all the time. Yeah, good. So now do that with the idea of exposing it more, right? Okay. We're going to circle in a minute and you can do it there. Uh -huh. But it's like if you if you continue to be aware of the catalyst, if you continue continue to be aware of the trigger in a way where it affects you, like carry it around with you until you find a moment to release it, right? Until you feel good about it. Sometimes you want a safe place to do that. Sometimes you don't feel good about falling apart. It's like I know I tell you guys don't adjust, just let it happen where it happens. But it's like sometimes you're not. You, you know, something like that, a paedophile or, or a murderer or a whatever, sometimes you need a brother with you, right? Sometimes you need a hand to hold. Wherever possible, be still and let that hand be the hand of Jesus. But I've had many times where I've had to go and knock on the door of a brother's house and go, hey, man, I, I need to sit here for a minute with you and just have you hold the light for, for me while I fall apart. <laughs> sometimes that falling apart can look like a minute, sometimes an hour, sometimes three or four months. Sometimes I never really get to the core of what it is that I'm looking at for an extended period. I'll feel the same energy dogging me, following me around, following me around. I feel miserable. I feel sad. I feel suicidal. I feel unhappy about something or whatever it is. And I can't seem to shake it. And all my attempts at prayer and meditation seem to amount to nothing. And then one day it'll just go. Boop. The pieces will all line up. The orchestration will occur and the healing will happen. God knows what needs to happen in me before I ask. God knows the healing I'm asking for but there's no point giving me that healing if it's going to leave me in a state of mind where I don't know how to deal with it within myself because I would, I'd find myself in a worse situation, you know? And every time there is a shift, you'll be, it'll feel like the rug's been pulled out from under your feet. Every time you have a big shift, it's like your whole mind just goes, whoop, gone, right? And you're terrified of that moment because that moment is so reminiscent of the fall from grace. We're all of a sudden ah. completely loved and loving, and then whoop, right? All ah. of a sudden, you're gone. Oh, that lands like ah. <laughs> light bulb. Oh right. my god! Right, the original sin. It's reflects in anything, everything. everything, everything. Always take it back to God. You got to deal with it here on Earth. But take it back to God. It's a reflection of your relationship with the Holy One. <laughs> and it, you know, since um, sort of doing the course, having I mean, like landslides of, of shifts, it's almost like the trigger, like the trigger that I was talking about this week, that kind of comes up every now and again. It's all, but when it does, it's nothing externally. It's like nothing, nothing. But inside, it's like a bullet like it's getting more refined it's getting more yeah. um i was having a chat with a friend this like week this. Was chatting about like it this. it's coming in coming in coming in getting more obvious 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 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Alpha, you know, when you... Omega. Now. Yeah, it's like no, it's. I just I can't really put it into words. It's like that. It's becoming more. What needs to release is like more refined. It's like that's it. But externally, it's kind of like nothing could get passed off. But the more like yeah. the tuning in, it's becoming more. It's like that thread, that kite, tiny, tiny thread is that one. Right, get that one. You know, like, but it's a big thing as well. Oh, I'm not making much sense, but <laughs> no, it makes sense. You, when you when you're out here, it seems to be separate from you. Your reaction to it may not be that much, but it may trigger a catalyst in you that it's deep like, out yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. You only see the tip of the iceberg out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's you're like you're boom. reacting to the effects of your own thinking. In you. You're only seeing the iceberg above the waterline there, but like you have a look underneath and it's like, holy crap, that's a big iceberg. Yes. Right? Thank you. Those are the words. Yeah. yeah thank right. you. In our circle, stand there with the tip of the iceberg. Okay. Okay. Stand in with the tip of the iceberg that you've identified out there in you, whatever, and offer it to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will go under the waterline and get the whole lot. You don't have to do that. You just have to be willing to be still and let that happen. It's like surgery. Like the surgeon's got his knife in there and he's right near your heart and he's getting something there. Don't move. Don't adjust. Right? His hands are not shaky, but if you if you go like... <clears throat> let it happen. We're getting to a point now there's like a, a maturity in this in you guys. You're starting to see it. You're starting to understand what it is that you're up against, that you're looking at, right? Not so you can focus on the error, but so you can effectively deal with it when it comes up, okay? 99.9% .9 of the time, I hope, you guys are just walking around peacefully and happily and loving and doing all this stuff. When we come together in these Zoom meetings, they're more and more going to start representing the core of the work, which is the ugly stuff, because this is a journey into fear. Right? At the beginning, it's all exciting. <laughs> but it's like climbing, climbing a mountain, you know, like the last bit of that mountain is always the hardest bit because you're exhausted. You don't think you can go on. But it's like nearly there. It's like any threshold. As you approach the threshold, it's like, I'm nearly there, I'm nearly there. And you can, do a, you can do a funny experiment with this, right? This is how the mind tricks you. This is how your own mind tricks you. If you say to yourself, I'm going to do 20 push-ups, right? You'll get to about 18 and you'll be like, Aah! you'll start to struggle, right? However, if you tell yourself you're going to do 30 push-ups, you'll get to about 28 and you'll start to struggle, right? That's a true thing. Now, why is that? Because you're approaching a threshold. In your mind, you equate the idea of a threshold with um, an issue, with a problem, with, a, with, a, um, with your relationship with God. Because as you, let's say, as you return to God, the same way as when you left the fall, there was a threshold with that. All of a sudden, I'm falling, I'm falling, I'm falling, ah, I'm gone. Right? It's like a portal. Imagine it like a portal, like a plug hole. You've been yeah. sucked. When you get closer to the plug hole, the fear and the anxiety and everything of being sucked in the plug hole, like when it starts to surface. When there's plenty of water in the tub, you don't even care. Right? Yeah. When you're going to God, everything has a threshold. It's like my relationship here, my relationship there has a threshold. Anthea, it's like my relationship with my ex-husband in that healing process, there's going to be a threshold between where it is I'm looking at it as an idea that needs healing and where it is that it's actually healed in me, right? At some point, I cross that threshold and the need for healing is done, right? But it's all reminiscent. It's all reflecting my relationship and the, the story that I have with God in that relationship of returning back the way I came, right? Repentance. I'm turning around and going back the way I came that portal, that tiny moment of terror at thinking that I've become separate from God is what I've got to face again as a threshold moment as I go back, right? 
you can call that the dark night of the soul, um, whatever the return, whatever you know, the the story of the prodigal son where he has to face his own fear and and uh, guilt of failure and being ridiculed by his family and all that sort of stuff. Where in fact there was only love that welcomed him back in. My son, you've come home. Hooray! Give, embrace your father. No ridicule, no judgment at all. But that was what he feared. The threshold of that is a fearful point. It's like when you have to do something, if you had to do public speaking, you'd be fearful of it, maybe, if you're not a competent public speaker. And then when you have to actually step up to the podium, there's a threshold that you have to cross with your own anxiety and fear of speaking to the point where you actually start speaking. Right At that point where you actually start speaking, the, the fear of it, of speaking no longer is there. It's gone. Right? You start speaking and it, ju and it just starts to come out. Right? It's like running a running race. If you're, in, if you're an Olympian or a, or a sports person or something, you might have a fear of coming last and you'll face that fear, face that fear, face that fear, and there'll be a threshold of it until finally the race is finished and you discover who came last. Then there's no fear. It either was you or it wasn't you. But there's a threshold where all of a sudden you start running. It doesn't matter anymore. You can't do anything about it. What's the point in being fearful? <laughs> Whoever comes last comes last. The whole race, the whole race can't happen unless somebody comes last. There's no point running a race with only one person who's guaranteed to win. Right? It's the person that comes second that allows the person who wins to come first. Right? There's a threshold where that realization of the inevitability of the situation dawns on your mind and you're liberated from the fear of it. So you see the tip of the iceberg. Somewhere in you, then there's an anxiety or, or an energetic response to it because somewhere in your mind, you're aware how deep the iceberg goes. You say to me, there seems to be more inside than outside. I seem to have a little reaction to something out there, but it seems to trigger so much in me. Right? Because it's an echo of your relationship with God. Right? It's not just triggering some relationship with child abuse or something else like that. It's triggering a relationship symbolically of the relationship that you have with the whole. You are God's child. You do feel abandoned and abused and all of these things. These are things we can relate to. Right? Healing has to proceed along lines that you understand. Otherwise, you wouldn't know that you were healing. You wouldn't even know you were sick. You wouldn't know that you were in a dream if you couldn't understand the nature of the dream. So on this level, you see a situation playing out out there. You equate it in here as, oh, this is my emotional response to it. And then that emotional response is reflective of the relationship you have with God right? in that story. That's why we learn the story of the prodigal son. That's why we learn the story of the fall from grace or the, or the original error, the original sin. Jesus calls it the, the tiny mad idea. Right? He talks about it in the course. And it's like, oh, everything on earth reflects that tiny mad idea moment for everybody. It's a constant ongoing, that's what it's actually made up of. All earthly associations are made up as a reflection of that tiny mad idea moment, right? Two kings in different countries make a decision to go to war. As soon as that decision's made, everything that happens after that decision is an, is an effect of that decision to go to war. People are dying, people are suffering, widows are crying, children are fatherless, all these sorts of things goes on, right? People are concerned about the war, but they forget that uh, they forget about the original decision that was made. They're in a battle for their lives. Right? Somewhere they know that their king made a bad decision and now they're paying for it. Right? Somewhere in eternity, in your in your God mind, in your Christ mind, you know that there was a decision made or an idea ended in there that you forgot to laugh at, and this is the result. <laughs> and now we're learning to laugh all the effects of our thing away together. Yeah, I'm going swimming. You're going swimming? Yeah. All right. And my hands are going to fucking pop. <laughs> Hi, Dean. Much love to all.
Much love. Enjoy your swim. Like wiping your slate clean. Yeah, it's like yeah. wiping. But you can, I can put more whatever. I don't know what it, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I know when I go swimming, it's like, I don't know, better, new, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. I don't know, blank, empty. That's what happens. My head empties. I go swimming and my head empties. And then uh, more stuff can happen. And then I can, then I do my unbinding for another period. And then it gets too much. And I, and I go tell everyone, Michelle, you need to go for a swim. Or I go and tell them, you should go for a swim. I go and you should go for a swim. You should go for a swim. You might feel you much better. I'll go for a swim. And I just keep forgetting. <laughs> I need to go for a swim. <laughs> and I need to go for a swim. I need to, I wanted to go for a swim last night. I, just, I would have gone for a swim I was, last I was night. Swim last night I, would have been great. I thought I need to go for a swim. I need to go for a swim. Uh, fucking. Mm. And if I would have went for a swim, I probably wouldn't have had that nightmare. You never know. New moment. Yeah, great. <sighs> All right. Peace and love, brother. Peace and love. Thank you, thank you.